Surah An-Nisa, which is a Madani chapter that was revealed in Medina. And every chapter in the Qur'an is named after a word uh, or some thematic context in the Qur'an. Invariably, the name is actually in there, but it's usually... There's no name in the Qur'an that isn't for some immense reason. I think the thing about these verses that struck me and I think would strike you also is just how incredibly modern the Qur'an is. Ibn Umar was asked what was the best way to understand the Qur'an and he said the passage of time. Just let time pass and, and the Qur'an will explain itself. One of the things that I'm absolutely convinced of is that the Muslims haven't, for some time, haven't really had a, a dialogical relationship with the Qur'an and in actually looking at it as a book that's talking to them. It's become a devotional book uh, where people read it for weddings and funerals and, and in the mosque maybe they'll do a khatam or devout Muslims will tend to read something every day. But the idea of really trying to understand the book and the fact that the book is open to these multiple interpretations is what's really, I think, fascinating because it's always forcing the human being to, to really struggle to understand it. And that's what tadabbur is and that's what ishtihad is. It's trying to understand it. So in this chapter, which deals with the rights of women, which is very important. I mean, somebody pointed out, and I think it's very true, is that one of the women complained to the Prophet ﷺ about what she thought was sexist language, right? Which is very interesting because people think that's some kind of modern concept, right? They think that it's women realized after centuries that language seemed to exclude them. And thanks to a group of academic ladies in America in the late 20th century, that problem has been resolved or at least addressed. But one of the women came and she said, Ya Rasulullah, why does the Qur'an always just mention the men? And immediately after that, all the verses that were revealed that dealt with men and women added the woman in there. And mu'minun wa mu'minat and muslimun wa muslimat. To me, one of the beauties of that is that what it's saying is, is that you have to speak up. You have to look and think it's not just going to be spelt out for you. And that was the beginning, because if you think in terms of, of what we have come to realize about the exclusivity of language, the fact that that was addressed 1,400 years ago is something really extraordinary about the Qur'an, that that, that was addressed, that it was recognized, and it was also part of the divine unfolding, that this is something that needs to be brought to people's attention in how they speak and in how they think. It's very interesting that that's in there. But if we look at 19, verse 19, in Surah An-Nisa, it says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who believe, and that's generally maddening and, and addressed to the believers. La yahillu lakum an tarithu nisa karha. It's not permissible for you to inherit women against their will. Now, there's different meanings to this verse and there's different reasons but generally these verses which come immediately after verses that deal with tawbah the verses that precede this immediately is وَلَيْسَتَ التَّوْبَةُ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ حَتَّى إِذَا أَحْضَرَ أَحْدُكُمْ الْمَوْتِ قَالَ إِنِّي تُبْتُ الْآنَ that tawbah is not for people who've done all these evil deeds and then when death comes to them they say oh now I'm making tawbah Toba is about redressing wrongs once you recognize them, which does not mean that Toba can't go up to the point of death. But the point is, is once you know that you're doing wrong, you better make Toba and don't delay it because to delay Toba is, is a wrong action. So the point here is that you know, forgiveness is not for those who do ill deeds until when death comes upon them. They say, now I repent nor yet for those who, who die while they were in a state of denial about Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for those people, that it's prepared this terrible punishment. And then immediately after that, oh, you who believe. So the point is, is like, this is redressing wrongs. 
And what toba is about is redressing wrongs. Because that's one of the conditions of toba is to redress your wrong. So the verses that follow are telling us there are wrongs in the Jahali society in how you dealt with women. And now these wrongs need to be redressed because we're offering a new way to people. And it's very interesting when the Prophet ﷺ, when Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh anhu, gave the death penalty to Bani Qurayza for being treacherous in their war because they'd made a treaty and then, then they were treacherous, they were judged according to the Torah, not according to the Quran. So it's like, if you want that way, you can have it. There it is. But this is a different way. And so the Prophet him, his way is the way of redressing wrongs, the way of, of teaching people a different way to be in the world. And so this comes because there were certain things that the Jahili Arabs did. One of them was that they literally used to inherit women. If their father was married to women when he died, if they weren't their mother, they would just go and throw a, a garment on them and declare them theirs. And there were a couple of reasons why they did it. They might have wanted to marry them, but usually they, it was a financial. They would arrange a marriage for them, and then they would take their dowry. So it was basically a way of just manipulating uh, women for financial gain. And this was prohibited, but then there's another meaning to the Qur'an, and this is part of the extraordinary flexibility and power of the Arabic language, is it is not permissible for you to terithun nisa akarha, that you should take their inheritance against their will. Because that's another human problem. People don't realize this, but historically, there have been incredibly wealthy women throughout Muslim history because that portion of inheritance in Arabia right now, there are women that have immense wealth. And if that wealth is not protected, in other words, if you have unscrupulous men that are going to steal that wealth, from the women, then their rights are not fulfilled. And there's an extraordinary book that I have that was written by a Moroccan scholar 200 years ago at Kiki, and he wrote it. He, he lived up in the Atlas Mountains, and he'd studied in Fes and come back to teach his people. And what they used to do is they used to, when a woman inherited, the male members, the, the agnates, would go, and they would force her to sign over all her wealth to them because they didn't want the wealth to go to whoever she'd married. So they would do this. And this jahiliya, but this is human beings. So Kiki wrote a book in which he gave a fatwa of the prohibition of any qadi accepting a document, turning over the wealth of a woman to her agnates. And the reason that he did that is because he felt that it was so prevalent amongst these people that they needed to be protected and so he considered it invalid until the Qadi ascertained that she was not being coerced. So the point is is that even though you have the, the practice and human beings will often fall short of the practice, the role of the scholar in the society is to defend what's right. And that's why in the human condition we always have this tension between the ideal and the reality. It's always there, and that's the nature of human beings. There will always be a, a tension between the ideal and the reality. And this is why Muslims traditionally, scholars, never went into government. And the reason they didn't do it is because that tension is no longer there, because the realities of government always fall short of the ideal, unless a prophet is ruling. That is just a fact. And if you believe otherwise, you're being fooled by utopian theories. If you actually believe that it's ever been other than that, with possibly one or two exceptions to prove the rule, and they're students of prophets, which is the four khulafa, and then the great exception is Umar ibn Abd al-Aziz. I mean, why is it that Muslims can't find any other example in the history of Islam, of somebody that was ruling other than small tribal or clannish type situations that you find. I mean, that's always existed, or very brief flash in the pan moments of a righteous ruler. Umar ibn Abdulaziz lasted two years. You have people like 
Amir Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, very short period of time. The Shaykh Uthman Danfodi, a very short period of time. And it's not sustained as an empire or sustained as, it's just an individual who happens to be extraordinary and is able to do that, which it just doesn't happen historically. So they're anomalous, and you should never, the Arabs have a, you know, in, in the science of logic and in bayan, there's a principle, a shed yuhfad wa la yuqasa alayh, that something that is anomalous is always kept into consideration, but you never use it as a standard. You don't use the anomaly as a standard to measure things, because you'll end up coming to false conclusions about the world.